Hi, I'm Chris Schmidt, co-executive producer for NOVA. On behalf of myself and my co-executive producer, Julia Court, welcome and thank you for joining us. At NOVA, we're committed to making the joy and power of science accessible to everyone. Science affects us all, and we're excited to tell stories that are inclusive and relevant, stories that celebrate human curiosity and the enormous thrill and wonder of scientific exploration. That's why we're so excited to bring you this spectacular five-part series and tonight's conversation inspired by Nova Universe Revealed. This latest co-production from Nova PBS and the BBC Studios Science Unit seeks to understand our place in a story that unfolds on the biggest canvas of all, the vast expanse across time and space of everything there is, ever was, or will be. Across five episodes, all now available to stream on pbs.org nova and the PBS video app, the series tells the dramatic story of the cosmos, beginning with the age of stars, then our own home, the Milky Way, alien worlds, black holes, and the ultimate origin story, the Big Bang. Each episode will bring us face to face with some of the universe's most surprising characters and reveal the role they each play in our own story. And for more bingeable content, we hope you'll check out Nova Now, our bi-weekly podcast, which is currently rolling out five universe-themed episodes. Subscribe for free to get all episodes of Nova Now and Nova Now Universe Revealed on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your podcasts. We're so grateful to PBS, the David H. Koch Fund for Science, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and the Nova Science Trust, which is a group of individual donors who generously support our mission, for making this series possible, and to the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for their generous support of public engagement and outreach. I want to extend a special thank you to Liz Abel Neuweiser and Mary Cardona Foster at GBH, and to Gina Varamo and Jennifer Welsh from Nova for all their hard work organizing this event. And now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Alok Patel, host of Nova Now and Nova Now Universe Revealed. Physician, science communicator, and somewhat of a space nerd who will be our moderator for this evening's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I am somewhat of a space nerd, but after dropping out of an astronomy minor because I couldn't hack it, the closest thing I'll get to understanding space is wearing a Marvin the Martian lapel pin. But well, on that note, good evening, everyone, or morning or night, or tuning in from wherever you are. You might be on another planet. Who really knows? But welcome to Nova Universe Revealed clip screening and panel discussion. This is like your inside Hollywood red carpet behind the scenes look at all the inner workings of Nova Now and the Universe Revealed, which is a phenomenal place to be. I'm Alok Patel, host of the Nova Now and Nova Now Universe Revealed podcast. And I'm your host for this evening's event. You know, I will take a step back and tell you that yes, I work as a physician and science communication is my everything, but I have been incredibly humbled by all the scientific experts I've gotten a chance to talk to from Nova Now, especially these all-star astrophysicists. You know, there's something incredible about talking to astrophysicists and cosmologists. And I learned that they are some of the most humbled grounded and philosophical experts I've ever met. I want to talk to these people I'm about to introduce you to about everything from black holes to galaxies to general life advice, because I feel like they're just brilliant people using the basic laws of science to expand our curious questions and relate all of it back to life on our little blue planet. So with that, we will be watching some experts from this series and discussing some of the amazing discoveries about the history of our universe with these four incredible scientists who participated in this series. They are interstellar rock stars. And a wise person once said, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. I'm in the right room because I'm the dumbest person here. Here we go, introducing all four of these people. We have Dr. Anjali Tripathi, astrophysicist and science ambassador for NASA's Exoplanet Exploration Program based out of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Anjali has explored the formation and evolution of planets through research on protoplanetary disks and computer simulations of exoplanets losing their atmospheres. She's also the reason I have these fabulous like pop art planet exploration posters behind me. Next up we have, and behind her, I copied her. <laughs> Next up we have Priya Natarajan, who is a professor in the departments of astronomy and physics at Yale University. 
She's noted for her work probing the nature of dark matter and dark energy, using gravitational lensing, and for developing models that describe the assembly and growth histories of black holes in the universe. Mis like mysterious, incredible, fascinating, kind of scary, but completely brilliant. All the stuff about dark matter and black holes. And next up, we have Dr. Hakim Olushei, astrophysicist, science TV personality, and global science education activist. His research includes astrophysics, technology development, and STEM education. He's a Robinson's professor at George Mason University and president-elect of the National Society of Black Physicists. He also is going to send me a signed copy of his new book, A Quantum <laughs> Life, My Unlikely Journey from the Street to the Stars. And last but certainly not least is Dr. Grant Tremblay. He's an astrophysicist at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. Dr. Tremblay uses data from the world's most powerful ground and space observatories to better understand star formation amid energetic feedback from supermassive black holes. That sounds very simple, <laughs> but absolutely inspired and humbled by all of you. So thank you so much for joining us today. Before we begin, an important note to our audience, we wanna hear from all of you because your curiosity is what drives our inspiration and all the work that we're doing here at NOVA. So if you have questions for our panel, do not be shy, drop them in the Q&A here in Zoom. We'll try to get to many, as many of them as possible. And our panel said, bring it on, ask anything you want. So we're gonna introduce the first clip for all of you, talking about supernovas. We're currently living in the age of stars and you go outside, when the lights are low or when you're in a rural place and you can see our universe shines with innumerable stars born from even more stars that have come and gone before them. But like humans, stars can't live forever. And the most massive luminous stars have the shortest lifetimes. So let's check out this clip from the age of stars to find out why and how they burn out. Now, so this is exactly what I mean about this group of experts being able to take a topic like supernova and just capture you with it. I would have never have put the quote, live fast, die young, <laughs> as it relates to star formation, but Grant somehow did it. So let's open this up to our panel and just kind of have an open discussion about this. Anjali, I want to start with you. And you, because you talked to me about this on the podcast, and I just want to get your open perspective. How does exploding stars in this supernova, the supernovae, I don't even know what the plural that word is, how does it pave the way for the future of stars, planets, and even potentially life in the universe? Yeah, and so when Grant says they lived fast and died young, which is such a great way to encapsulate it, there's one step before that, which is they burned bright, just like the biggest stars in Hollywood. Um, and as they're going through all of these phases of their lives, they're leaving us with these gifts as they, you know, um, evolve from being on the main sequence to the supernovae um, that we see. And this gives us all of the chemical elements that make life such a delight. Because if you ask an astronomer what's a metal, they'll tell you everything on the periodic table after hydrogen and helium is a metal. And the way that you get some of these heavier things past iron are actually from supernovae. So the fact that I am not just full of hot air exclusively, um, that I'm more than hydrogen and helium is entirely due to the gift of supernovae. Um, and it's really kind of remarkable that we are made of star stuff um, because it's, as you said earlier, Alok, we are all very philosophical when it comes to being astronomers. We are all made of star stuff. So Grant, because you've been, sh you've been given two shout outs now, I'm gonna throw this next question to you. If <laughs> our, what would our universe be like if we had no stars? I mean, obviously, darkness, but given what Anjali just mentioned about star matter, what would the world be like with no stars, the universe be like? Yeah, I like to think of stars as the great engines of chemical complexity in the cosmos. And what I mean by that is, you know, we, we start on a planet Earth, we think of it as just one tiny little rock sitting in this vast, boundless cosmic ocean. What is our meaning? What is our purpose? And yet, a blade of grass is vastly more complex than even a black hole or even a star or a mega parsec scale intercluster medium. And one of the reasons for that is because the planet on which we sit has grown out of the corpse of a previous generation of stars, right? And, and as a star lives and then dies, it increases the chemical complexity of its ambient environment and the cosmos as a whole. Um, and so, yeah, think of it 
stars as these great factories that turn primordial elements like hydrogen into more chemically complex elements that can then, you know, find their way next to each other and <laughs> pile up on a primordial planet and ultimately give rise to life. This is what I'm talking about. A blade of grass is inherently more complex than a black hole. You guys are just blowing my mind right now. And I prepared for this. I prepared to not be shocked. I don't know. I should speak up a little bit here for black holes, though. I mean, you know. <laughs> Advocate. I think they, yeah, yeah. They, you know, I want to add to that sort of the, the limerick, right? They burn bright, they live fast, they die young, and they leave a glamorous corpse. Those are the massive you know, stars that are about you know, 10 to 8 to 10 times the mass of our sun, and they leave behind a black hole. So no, I agree with Grant that you know, probably some of the most complex things in the universe are sort of life. I think you know, the cool thing about um, these chemical elements that both Anjali and um, Grant have talked about is that in the very early universe, which was like a hot furnace, you could only make up to lithium on the periodic table. Essentially everything, so that's atomic number seven, right? And there's well over 190 elements in the periodic table and all the rest of them were synthesized in the centers of stars. Like, you know, generation after generation, as uh, both of them pointed out, they, you know, stars form, they spew out these chemicals and then the next generation of stuff, stars form from this polluted stuff with all the metals and sort of there are these factories so yeah, without stars, uh, we wouldn't be here. So a- just as sh- the, the good doctor spoke up on behalf of black holes, I got to speak up on behalf of stars. <laughs> I like this. I talk about the, the Hollywood kind. I'm talking about the burning bright in the sky kind. And the reason why I say that is because I think stars get uh, uh, simpl- they're, they're oversimplified, right? So I look at stars as being mainly two objects. There's a core. And that's what ultimately becomes the neutron star, the white dwarf, the black hole. And then there's this thing called the envelope, right? So that's everything outside of the core that's pressing down on it, keeping it hot. And that's what allows that nuclear fusion to happen in the core. But elements aren't just created in the core. They're also created in the envelope. As neutrons stream out of the core, because they're electrically neutral, they're not repelled by atomic nuclei. So they'll sneak into a nucleus and then due to the weak force, right? They will become a proton. Become a proton, electron, and neutrino, right? That energy goes and creating these other particles. Uh, and so the envelope also creates heavy elements. And then when those leftover cores like, neut- like, like uh, neutron stars collide, they create a lot of heavy elements, right? So the first one we saw created over an Earth, an Earth's mass and gold. And so we're like, ah, but here's, let me tell you the thing that really gets me about you know, it's not us. It's the fact that this atmosphere, this cool atmosphere that sustains us, that we inhale. Every time you do that, you're inhaling the core of a star. Several stars, probably. Like, that's nuts to me. I'm, I'm, I'm breathing in. I'm breathing in the star matter. So let's, let's like, bring it back to what I consider to be a very luminous star, which I know you all are going to roll your eyes at when I say our very own sun. So could you just, I, that's, I, didn't I call it? I said that someone would tease me for that. I look at the sun, I grew up in Arizona, it seemed pretty powerful. But <laughs> Dr. Olushe, because you had the most dramatic reaction to my misinterpretation of our sun's power. What do we know about our sun and where it is in its life? Are there questions about our sun we're still, we're still trying to answer? Yeah, it's just like me, about halfway there, right? It's about halfway done with this life. But the thing about the, the sun and the earth is that they constantly evolve. We think of them as being steady. The way they are today is the way they were a billion years ago. That's not the case. The sun gets a little bit bigger every day. And so that means that in about a billion years, life here on earth is gonna be very different. I'm gonna leave it there because I don't wanna be a downer. We just went through two years of pandemic. So I'm gonna stop there. And you know, so we're getting some really good audience questions right now. And this this goes back to something Grant you were mentioning and um, Anjali, you were mentioning too about how stars can kind of give us hints about how old our universe is. And I have two questions right now. One of them is about how well, how do we know that the universe is 10 billion, not 10 billion, how the universe is 10 billion years old. I think it's older than that. But also a another one is about <laughs> a little bit. The other question is what's the evidence that the universe is larger than 14 million light years? 
So in layman's terms, given the fact that we have another minute, if we were at a, do- a bar talking to the lay audience, what is the evidence for that? Anyone? I, I, I'd love to handle the, uh, the second one, which was- I can what? do the first one. Um, oh, I think we, well, we've measured, there are a bunch of different independent ways to measure the age of the universe. And one simple way to think about it is to look at the ages of the oldest stars that you can find, right? So we know, uh, we know stellar evolution. We, we understand the birth and death of stars so well that we can actually clock them quite well. So when we find the oldest stars, we know that the universe has to be at least as old as the oldest stars, if not older. And so the oldest stars in um, globular clusters, these sort of loose agglomerations of stars, are about 10 billion-ish years old. So we know that the universe at least has to be 10 billion years old. We think it's closer to 13.8 billion years old. And there are a bunch of other methods that have been used to um, measure the age of the universe. One method is to really try to understand the evolutionary history of our universe, the expansion history. We know that our universe has been expanding. uh, And from the rate of expansion, by looking at objects that are further and further away, we can actually measure the um, this expansion rate that then, you know, in a simple way is a measure of the age of the universe. So there are multiple independent ways. And what is amazing, well, well, you know, they, they mostly agree. There's a little bit of a disagreement, which is the current sort of, uh, there's a controversy on the age of the universe. But, you know, by and large, we all agree that it's of the order of 13.8-ish billion years. Yeah. And as far as the size of the universe goes, um, it's more complicated than you would imagine. And that's because the universe is expanding. And so the expansion of the universe does funny things to what you perceive, such that you may perceive something as being closer or farther. So let me give you an example. How do we measure distances? My PhD advisor used to say to me over and over, all of us in our group, the most important and the most difficult measurement in all of astronomy is that of measuring distance. If you look through a telescope from one star to the other, they all look like a dot, right? How can, how can you tell? So the first thing we do is we use the most direct way that we call blacks, right? But that only works nearby in our galaxy. When we're talking about making cosmological measurements of distance. We can use what we call standardized candles. That means there is an object that we know how bright it is. So based on how bright it appears, we can tell how far away it is. And what happens is the expansion of space dims objects more than the distance effect, all right? Uh, it, It affects the light in that way. Another thing that you can do is you can look at the sizes or separations between two objects because we know that as objects get farther away, they appear smaller. But again, that's kind of made complex by the expansion of the universe because When you go away, objects do look smaller and smaller, and then they look bigger and bigger because when that light started traveling toward you, they were close, but then the expansion of the universe took them farther away. Another thing is, is that if you look at how long the light has had to travel to you, okay, and the crazy thing about that is that all three of those methods give you a different answer, and none of them tell you how far something is away from you now, and we call that the co-moving distance. Right. So when we say, oh, we can see objects that are up to 40 billion light years away, but the universe is only 13.7, 13.8 billion years old. How is that possible? Well, it has to do with the fact that they've been carried away beyond our horizon. Right. So, uh, you know, but even then, what we also know is that that Big Bang did not mean everything was in the same place. Right. We could have started off with a universe that was infinite in extent, although very hot and dense. And today is even more infinite, (laughs) right? Uh, And so we don't know the actual size of the universe, but we know how far away the most distant objects we've measured are. And this, this, Dr. Luce, this almost reminds me of what Grant was mentioning in terms of when you see an object you're technically seeing in the past, right? By even a nanosecond. I I said that in a very terrible elementary. Even here on Earth, right? Yeah. Looking at the and I'll tell you well, why that is. I'll tell you why that is. Because we're biased. Here on Earth, we think, us humans, we think, oh, the speed of light is so fast. But really, it ain't. It's only fast because we're so small. 
the nearest galaxy is two million light years away, right? Okay, go ahead, Grant. Audience, just remember this before we go to the next clip. You have never witnessed the present in your entire life. You are always looking into the past. And the further away in space, the deeper in time. All right. I think it's so totally cool, yeah, for people to realize that even when you look out at the sun, right, you're seeing it as it was eight minutes ago. Like you're not seeing it at the same minute moment that you are watching. Oh, this was a philosophical bunch. Also, <laughs> everyone needs to decide right now if you're team blade of grass or your team black hole, because we're going to go to the next clip right now, which is going to give everyone a special sneak peek of tomorrow night's episode of Nova Universe Revealed black holes do not screen record this and share it because you will get sued because it's a sneak peek so let's take a look they still scare me but priya <laughs> i'm going to you first because yes. you are our central advocate right now i want to know you you know you have experience for studying black holes can you tell us how are these objects responsible for assembling our entire universe well, I think they, um, so, it, you know, it turns out that black holes, right, as as probably everybody in the audience knows, they, they originally started out as these bizarre solutions, mathematical curiosities, solutions to Einstein's equation. No one imagined they would be real objects, right? Then the first black holes were found in terms of, you know, they found the end states of stars. They started finding quasars, which are basically feeding black holes that um, at that point, we thought still that they were marginal. Although they were at the center of pretty much every galaxy, including our own, like our own galaxy, the Milky Way, has a black hole that is 4 million times the mass of the sun. But you know, the mass of the black hole is tiny compared to the mass of the stars in our galaxy, right? The total mass of our, our galaxy is 10 to the 12 times the mass of the sun. So the black hole by mass is really tiny. It has a small region where it dominates. So people believe that, you know, maybe it was really marginal in, you know, gravity rules the cosmos. So in terms of gravity, they really, they are peculiar beasts. They have these strange, bizarre properties, but in the overall scheme of the galaxy itself, like even a single galaxy, they're pretty inconsequential. But it turns out in the last 10, 20 years, we've realized that they actually play a really important role in shaping the galaxy. So when gas is, you know, on the dying gasps, as gas is getting pulled into a black hole, it starts to glow and, you know, we can see it, right? So that's what the Event Horizon Space Telescope kind of mapped. They sort of, the gas that is right, you know, before it sort of really goes to a point of no return. So what we know that these black holes can spew out huge jets, so lots of hot gas that moves well beyond its gravitational reach, you know, because remember they are peculiar gravitationally, but they are still kind of, you know, dominate over a small range. Their gas outflows reach very large distances and they can prevent stars from forming. So they kind of are like a piston that controls how many stars can form in a galaxy. So they have like outsize effect on a galaxy and they shape therefore the stellar content in the galaxy. At least that's what we believe now. Wouldn't you say so, Grant, that that's sort of what we now believe? Absolutely. And the, the, the incredible thing, like Priya said, if you take a billion solar mass black hole, the actual physical size of that event horizon, the so-called Schwarzschild radius, is about the size of our solar system. It's about a sphere that, that go, would go out to the orbit of Neptune, right? If you take that black hole and compare it to the size of the galaxy in which it resides, it's like comparing a grape to the size of the Earth. And yet, we think black holes are in so many ways the sort of conductors of the great cosmic symphony. They, they can sculpt the evolution of the entire galaxy that they're residing in. It's like a moth like flapping its wings and causing a hurricane across the entire globe. And, and it's beautiful. And I don't think of black holes as sort of engines of destruction. In many ways, I think they're, they're elegant, right? They don't just inhibit star formation. They can even trigger it um, and, and act almost like a thermostat in your home, regulating the, the star formation rate. Yeah, they the bring galaxy. balance, don't you think, Grant? They bring this sort of balance in the universe, um, in uh, galaxies, you know, sort of uh, shaping them, forming stars, turning them off and, you know, turning them on. Like, they're switches but really exciting switches. I'm loving, I'm loving the analogies, Grant, especially like the moth causing a hurricane. 
And that makes me think that's something that Priya mentioned about these bizarre physics that are happening. And Anjali, I was wondering if you could give us an example of some of the extreme physics that are taking place around the black holes. I might be biased, but I find this stuff like fascinating. I mean, there's so much, um, you know, that we want to study about black holes, right? We talk about it as having strong gravity, and that's something that we just can't experience here on Earth. So, you know, just like at the end of that clip, you saw this amazing picture of the light that was bending, not just around the black hole like this, but you saw it sort of coming in front of it. Um, and that's because you have things um, like light and time that are behaving really differently about the black hole. So, you know, I think about planets and I love to think about how we find them in all kinds of places. Um, there are hints that maybe we have found some around exotic objects like this, but even the very first planets that we actually ever discovered outside of the solar system were found around cousins of black holes, the neutron stars, where, you know, you've got light shining out of these really compact objects where, you know, like a coffee cup would, you know, weigh more than I could um, ever hope to lift because it would be like the mass of the Earth. Um, and so you have these neutron stars that have these beams of light, kind of like a lighthouse going around, but you have them going on hundreds of times a second. So if you were on a planet living around a pulsar, you would have like this disco light phenomenon going on that would probably give you seizures if you had issues with strobe lights. And so, you know, thinking about black holes and how they're taking um, part of the universe um, I think you know, into the darkness. Uh, and I'm thinking about, you know, other objects and the light that you're going to get within them. And all of these end states of stars are just mysterious. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Anjali is really spot on when she says, you know, you'd get seizures around pulsars, but, you know, you really don't want to venture that close to a black hole. Fascinating yeah. as they are, <laughs> you don't want to really go anywhere near them. I would like to, to, to add something <laughs> because, you know, I've been doing this uh, science communication thing and sometimes we misspeak. And then people in the social media are like, oh, they're an idiot. They don't know. So the good Dr. Tripathi did a misspoke. She knew what she was saying, but she said mass, which she meant to say weight of the coffee cup on the neutron star. So all you jerks out there that were getting ready to go on there, <laughs> back off. That's all I got. Guys, that, do not get the astrophysicist mafia on you, all right? They will they'll dominate. But hold up, because I, you know, Hakeem, I do want to bring you back because we had just mentioned nobody would want to go into a black hole. But if I remember correctly, a certain someone on the clip said, forget the one way trip to Mars, I want to go into a black hole. So I want to ask Absolutely. you why and what that would be like, like how, how would, what, yeah. what, what would the simulation be of diving into a black hole? Well, it's a difference if you're talking about the average human versus me, right? I mean, there. Yeah. <laughs> Grant would be torn apart. I might tear the black hole apart. But the key <laughs> is choosing the right black hole. Right? So we have these stellar mass black holes and we have these supermassive black holes. And so what black holes are known for, one of the famous things is spaghettification, these incredible tidal forces. Um, that doesn't happen with a supermassive black hole until you get really close to the center of the thing. So when you approach the event horizon, you probably won't, wouldn't notice much of anything, right? Uh, maybe looking around you, you'll, you'll notice something. But as far as yourself is concerned, but a supermassive black hole gives you a way of going inside the event horizon and looking around and going, ah, I see what happens inside of a black hole. Of course, I can't tell anyone, <laughs> but you know, I can see what's happening inside here. Because you know, to be honest, there are places like I'm a firm believer in what is what we accept is true is what we observe to be true. Our mathematics can tell us things, but it's not until we make an actual observation. Some you know, oftentimes our mathematics is absolutely spot on, but then sometimes <laughs> we don't know, and so. That black hole mathematics tells us there's a singularity there. I find that really unphysical, and I don't know how to escape it because space time is doing its thing. Uh, help me, Dr. Tripathi, doctors, Dr. H Dr. Hajaran. I, I mispronounced your name, Dr. That's N. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> but Natarajan, is that how I say it? That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes. Help me. How do I escape the singularity? That's what I want to know. After after Hakeem doesn't listen to your advice and goes into yeah. the black hole, how does he escape the similarity? Anyway. He wants to go in, and you know, I, if I remember the clip, he said, "I'm going to go in screaming." Actually, no one can hear you scream, so well, it'll be a pretty silent, you know. But um, but, but here's the thing: if you go to the surface of a planet, you've seen it before. Nobody's seen it. Both are a one-way trip. Why not die doing something <laughs> more interesting? 
you know, Hakeem, I appreciate the shout out to the posters that we have, right? Because, you know, in Spanish, this is talking about being devoured by gravity in a black hole, which we've been making, you know, the happy exoplanet travel posters, which tells you how we think about visiting those, where this is part of our Galaxy of Horrors series. So not everyone is with you on the, this is the place we want to visit as opposed to these. Yeah, but you know, I want to come back to the point that um, Hakeem raised about singularity. So, you know, Singular, we believe that one of the reasons why we're all sort of so obsessed with black holes, right, is they're really, really peculiar beyond just this sort of event horizon. We think that they encase in the center of a black hole. There exists a point where all physical laws break down. So notions of time, space, everything that we know uh, sort of breaks down. We don't know how to formulate the physics. And I think that is a very fascinating idea for me because, you know, at some level, it sort of tells you that there's a limit to knowledge. That So black holes kind of represent, uh, you know, the edge, right? The sort of the limits to what is knowable at the time. However, what is knowable changes over time, right? So for example, in 1548, Copernicus, right? He reordered the solar system, moved the Earth to this, um, away from the center and the sun, you know, he reordered the, and got the move from the geocentric to the heliocentric. You think he could have imagined that we would have flown two spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, that would leave the solar system? Do you think he could have imagined that? He can't. So, you know, we don't know the course of future science. So I don't know. I'm I'm very hopeful. We may actually crack the black hole mystery, right? I just don't know when. Well, I want to ask I want to ask one question because this this continues to perplex me. And you know, Hucky mentioned the space-time continuum. Grant is a master of analogies. Maybe there's something we can we can just fascinate our audience with here. During the Nova Now Universe Reveal podcast, you know, I was talking about the black holes and we made the same kind of joke about if I were to jump off the spaceship and, and fly towards a black hole, if I was in the event horizon, a little like three kilometer area outside of a black hole, and I hung out for two minutes and then went back to the spaceship, 20 years would have passed. I cannot wrap my head around that. Somebody please break that down for me again before we move on to <laughs> something else. Yeah, if we need to break this down in a minute, the, the audience should just know that for our purposes, time is basically inseparable from space, that they're fundamentally the same thing. And we as flesh and blood human beings simply experience the three dimensions of space differently than we do time. But if you think about it, what is your experience of time than watching things change in space, right? What is a day but the rising and the setting of the sun or an hour but the motion of a minute hand around the clock, right? And sure, we, we, you see your children get older and you don't remember the future, you remember the past. So there's apparently some arrow of time. But let me tell you right now, deep down in the fundamental laws of physics, there is no actual arrow of time. And maybe it's something to do with entropy. So what I want, my point with all of that is that we think uh, gravity is really just a reflection of the curvature of space-time, but gravity is also, therefore, the stretching and the warping of time itself. And so, if I were to drop a, a stopwatch with a with a spot, uh, you know analog hand and watch it with this imp impossibly powerful telescope as it fell ever closer toward a black hole, I would see that that hand tick slower and slower and slower until when it got to the event horizon. It would literally freeze in time for all of eternity. Time would apparently stop to an outside observer. And that's just because black holes warp space to such a degree that they become a discontinuity in the fabric of space-time itself. Sounds impossibly crazy. <laughs> These things exist. I need to watch the movie Event Horizon, and I need to watch Interstellar again with my new, that's like, right. Grant glasses on to kind of just be there and fact-check this. Now, let's... <laughs> I can do this all Just day. Make sure Let's move on to some. Uh, to end. What's that? Stop watching before you get to the end, and you're disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, harsh words. Well, I think I think we should have a Hollywood, you know, astrophysics consulting team right here for the next movie. But let's move on to some audience Q and A questions. Because what's fascinating about a Nova audience is they're so smart that I don't even understand some of these questions. There was one earlier, and I was like, I had to read it three times. I'll get back to it. I have one question I think is right up Dr. Tripathi's right up Dr. Tripathi's Prathi's Lane. So question, can our experts talk about multi-star systems, binary and beyond, like our neighbors in Alpha Centauri? What have astronomers learned in recent years about planetary formation in that kind of stellar environment? 
Even this question is beautifully written. So I think it's great that we got this question about multi-star systems, because here we are, we've been talking about stars, you know, as individuals, but really they like to be parts of families. They're, throughout the universe, you've got stars and binary systems, so two or multiple star systems, kind of like in this poster that both Alok and I have up, this Kepler 16b, right? You can see the two stars there, and that's actually because Kepler 16b is one of these planets that's going around two stars, and we found lots of planets. Um, in these multi-star systems. And so we know that throughout the universe, you definitely can have planets that are going around multi-star systems, binary systems. And so if we take a look at Alpha Centauri, which is our nearest neighbor, right? There's three stars in that system. There's Alpha Cent A and B, and then a little further out is Proxima Centauri. And we have hints that there might be planets around that, maybe Proxima Centauri. It is really hard for us to tell what's going on around Alpha Centauri A and B because those stars are so close and bright and they're a binary, the typical way that we actually tell if there are planets, you know, looking at the stars wobbling back and forth from the gravity of the planet um, makes that a little hard. So we don't know for sure what's there, lots more exploration to do um, and some really interesting work thinking about the future of how we'll find exoplanets, whether we're seeing them directly or detecting the motion of the star. Um, but certainly we know that, you know, from the example of Kepler 16b and which by the way, Star Wars, Tatooine, not your interstellar, but still got some accurate science there. Um, we think that you can definitely form planets and we're looking to find out what we'll see around our nearest neighbors and these other systems. I think the, I think the planet in pitch black, the Vin Diesel movie also has two stars. And for anyone who's curious, this poster says, Kepler 16b, where your shadow always has company. It's kind of creepy. So here's, here's a follow-up question about exoplanets, again, from a brilliant audience member, because I'm like, do I understand this question? Could the presence of exoplanets prior to the explosion be observed from any asymmetries in the expanding gas from a supernova explosion? Mm -hmm. I don't even know who to direct that to, but who wants to take that question? I'll take it. I love the question. And so, so the answer to first, so this is a beautiful question, right? So does, is the morphology or the shape of the ejecta from a supernova sculpted in any way by, by a planet orbiting a star? The, I, I, two answers. Almost certainly yes to a very small degree, right? Because the planet is going to be caught up in the in the ejecta as the shock passes, right? And it will induce some asymmetry in the ejecta. But my real answer to your question is that that would almost certainly never be observable by us from Earth because overwhelmingly the morphology or the shape of a supernova ejecta and what ultimately becomes a planetary nebula is dominated so much more by the, by the large scale processes uh, at work, for example, many planetary nebulae are shaped at, after a binary uh, supernova event by something called the common envelope phase, right? Um, and, and a tiny planet, even a big Jupiter planet, would induce an asymmetry that what might either be dynamically short-lived and certainly would be so small that we could probably never resolve it from Earth. I still think it's a beautiful question, and the answer is probably almost certainly yes to some degree. That, I'd I like to add to that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, doctor. No, yeah, please. Oh, well, what I'd like to add is, is, is an interesting dynamic that I learned from my uh, colleagues who study both uh, interacting supermassive black holes as well as uh, exploding stars, different groups of people. Um, and that is, is, for example, there's these cases where, you know, these asymmetries generate kicks, right? So you see these... Uh, things flying off, right? Supermassive black hole offset from the center of the of the galaxy uh, and, and uh, similar phenomena. So uh, you can get dynamics out of very energetic processes that are um, triggered by asymmetries in the precursor. And I guess I just wanted to add one thing, which is sadly, we are not at the point of seeing the planets themselves in the vast majority of cases of these planets we're detecting, right? So it's all about the star. So we don't even really think about detecting planets around supernovae. We're just not there yet. <laughs> yeah, we're not even. That, yeah, yeah, we've not there's even. There's something detected. else that Dr. Tripathi said. I'm, I'm sorry, I just wanted to get this uh, earlier. And that is, is that the first exoplanet that we discovered was around a neutron star. Right. It was because of, you know, this timing variation in the pulses. So that means that either 
that planet survived that supernova explosion or it was later captured. I don't know what the answer is, but there you go. Yeah, you had something to add? Yeah, I was just going to um, amplify what Anjali said, which is that, you know, so far we've actually not directly imaged um, a, an exoplanet, not quite, right? It's indirect evidence that they're there. So we're not yet at the stage to have um, like imaged your garden variety exoplanet, let alone one that forms in this really violent kind of environment. I mean, we yeah, have, that, right, you know, seen some planets that are really far out from their star, right? Something like HR 8799, where you can see these really amazing movies where you've blocked out the light from the star at the center and then you see things moving around. But it's not like, you know, you can see a close up of, you know, are there oceans on this side and clouds on this side? We're, we're not there yet. <laughs> well, that brings me to a previous question we had. And, you know, because, you know, Priya, you had mentioned about what we're lacking in terms of direct imaging. So my question is, how will new missions like the James Webb Space Telescope launching in December add to our understanding of the universe? What do the four of you want to see from that from that mission or, or in terms of what our next images are going to be? Happy to go first. Um, I think one of the incredible things about uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is the wave is the window into the universe that it's going to open up, right? So it's the infrared window, and we've never had this kind of range on any kind of uh, telescope before. And so what's cool about the infrared is that the very early universe was extremely dusty. It was very dusty, gassy. And therefore, the light that was made by the first stars, the light that is coming from the gas falling into the first black holes, which is all in the ultraviolet, actually gets scattered by the dust that is enshrouding them. And so you would not see it in any other wavelength. It would be blanketed out unless you had sensitivity to infrared because that's where it gets re-radiated. So the thing that I am most excited about um, us capturing with James Webb is sort of the first hints of when and how the first black holes formed and the first galaxies. I mean, they're inseparable, right? Because we don't know which formed first and whether they form, you know, uh, the order in which they turn on. And it's most likely they are sort of in lockstep already by the time uh, we get to capture them. So for me, that's the most exciting thing. The first Who else black is excited about something? I will just say, you know, we've question. been talking, we've been talking about detecting planets and it's great to like know there's a planet there, but I really want to know what the planet is like. So actually getting a chance to characterize its atmosphere, you know, is there water vapor? What chemicals and molecules are there? And that's something that James Webb is going to do a great job of telling us about, because right now, you know, you hear about Kepler, um, you know, that was a mission that stared at a patch of the sky, you know, sort of narrow, deep. Um, and now we have another spacecraft called TESS, which is looking at the whole sky and finding planets that are actually probably nearer than a lot of what Kepler found. And these are great targets for JWST to follow up. And so I'm really hoping, kind of like that planet right above your head, um, Alok, right, TRAPPIST-1, that's a system that JWST is going to tell us a lot about. And I'm really excited for that. And it looks dope. Sorry, dope is not a scientific term. It looks really interesting. Yes, it is. That's got yes, lots is. of planets packed in really tightly around the star. I think you've got, you know, what, seven inside of the orbit of Mercury compared to our solar system. So you can see, right, that you wouldn't just have a moon in the sky to look at. You'd have all of your planetary neighbors. Wow. I would like to say the professor in me, you know, if you look at how the question was asked, quite often people say, oh, what are we going to find? What are we going to discover? So you notice that even, you know, I like, I love sports. I like, I watch sports. Uh, and you see, they're always making these predictions, predictions, predictions. If someone ever asked me about the future, I tell them I don't make predictions unless it's from using the laws of physics, right? Otherwise, you're just completely speculating. And as scientists, we definitely don't want to take, fill in the blank with our ideas. So listen, we create these instruments with specific goals in mind but what we're always hoping that's going to happen is we discover stuff no one thought of we never saw because we have a lot of mysteries and everything we've done has been so great we're getting back the answers that we expect and that sucks <laughs> okay so i i i like the i like the postulation um, Hakeem, i'm gonna i'm gonna throw this audience question to you 
And hopefully the answer is something that we're not expecting, but what do you hope we will learn from samples from the Mars Perseverance mission when it returns to Earth in the 2030s? What is the unknown that we may see there? I guess we won't know because we don't know what the unknown is, but however you want to answer that question. Me? Life, that's easy, life. If we see evidence of fossil life, evidence of, you know, the, the most intriguing thing about Mars is the fact that we see, we're we seeing methane in the atmosphere periodically. And we know that methane is destroyed. It can only last a few centuries. So it must be getting replenished somehow. And the question is, is it biological? Is it geological? Or is it ancient biological fossil gas? So if they can uh, show us life somewhere, and you know, prob probably, we're not the only life in the earth, in the soul, in the universe. And, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, life gets started so easily, it seems, based on the evidence here on earth, that if you have fluids, which we see many, many places, and you have the right thermodynamic conditions, which we think may exist in certain places, then you could, you should get life. You won't necessarily get what we got here, a Cambrian explosion, because of something else. And I've been saying this, Dr. Tripathi can perhaps help me, but the thing that's different, you know, when you look at these planets like Tatooine and moons and such on sci-fi, they always have a sky. But what I see when it comes to atmospheres, either they're absent or they're super thick, right? The fact that we have a super thin atmosphere and a strong magnetic field makes Earth very unique, such that our early life that got started very early was bathed in sunlight for four billion years, and eventually it learned this trick called photosynthesis. But if that life happened to be on a planet like Venus or the moon Titan, not only would you not have that sunlight on the ground, you wouldn't even know that stars existed. Grant, right. thoughts? Um, yeah, or, I'm I sorry, mean, Priya, I, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to add that I think Hakeem is spot on that we shouldn't get locked into the idea of life as we know it. I think that's where the surprise is, no idea. Uh, because I think, you know, Stephen J. Gold said, right, even on Earth, if you turn back the clock on evolution and you run it back again, you may not end up with us because there's so much randomness that goes into um, evolution on Earth itself. So you can just only imagine that we have to be open to any possibility of uh, what uh, life elsewhere might look like. Absolutely. And, you know, when we, it might be spectacularly rare, maybe a one in a trillion shot, but never forget that when you look at those images of Mars from Perseverance and Curiosity, those rovers that are currently on the surface, it looks like this desolate, static, dry desert. Never forget that the Perseverance rover is sitting in the bottom of an ancient lake bed. There was once liquid flowing water on the surface of Mars, right? And we don't know if, if water is absolutely needed for life, right? But what we do know about water is that it is a phenomenal solvent, right? And a great driver of chemical disequilibrium, which we think is needed for life, right? For complexity to increase on small crossing times. And so, you know, look, I have no doubt that life is relatively abundant in the universe, even if it's spectacularly rare, just because the numbers involved are just so phenomenally vast, right? We could have easily, with a straight face, 10,000 advanced alien civilizations in our galaxy alone, We'll probably never know about it. Our entire species will live out its entire existence and never know about it. We do have a shot in our solar system on Mars, in a subsurface ocean on Europa, or in those cryovolcanic ejecta in uh, Enceladus, a moon of Saturn. Um, but... We just need to find the cows on Mars that are making all the methane. And then, you know, questions <laughs> answered, basically. So, <laughs> the spherical <laughs> cows. <laughs> Spherical cows that are making all this methane and keeping it alive century after century, they're there. Or they're, maybe they're, they're underwater in Europa and we there for us as well. That sounds a little That's creepier a, to me. If you watch uh, Europa Report, apparently uh, their aliens come in squid form. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I can't even. So I have um, a couple, couple quick questions before some closing thoughts. You know, this is a personal question. Is supernova a noun or a verb? Or both. Yes. Get a beauty that I want. All right. And an Europa adverb a, and an adjective. And apparently an adjective. Because <laughs> it's it may, that might be the most versatile word we have in the English language. So this next question: Do all stars, after they supernova, create a black hole? This is why I asked the question because I was like, "Cool nice. verb form." And I see Anjali just shaking her head, no, that they don't no, all create. Not black all holes. stars, yeah. 
not all stars do only stars that are born so stars are born with a range of birth masses and so the ones that are eight to ten times the mass of the sun those are the ones that end up as black holes they leave black holes as corpses the lighter so ones one leave white dwarfs and neutron stars and just kind of the, the lighter ones will still kind of throw out material around them to help to yeah. create stuff and and that's a that's a good follow-up for this question um, if supernovas happen after a star's fuel is used up, what powers the explosion? Are there fusion reactions and fusion energy production events between atoms other than those of hydrogen? Grant seems emphatic about this one. <laughs> you want to yeah, take this? I mean, sure, I'll take it. But I think Hakeem actually put it best. He describes stars as actually two objects, a core and an envelope. And the explosion that you see is actually the core starts to contract very rapidly. The envelope no longer has a floor to stand on, and so it starts to collapse, right? And the explosion that you see is actually the envelope bouncing off of the core um, and being ejected outward. I don't know if the or... I, I'm just in awe of all of you. I'm just listening now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that was pretty and nice. I, I guess just one thing to add about supernovae that's so amazing, right? When we think about astronomy and how far we've come, right? The fact that we have all of this new knowledge about black holes from the Event Horizon Telescope and LIGO. Similarly, supernovae, you know, within I think probably everyone on this panel's lifetime, you know, we got this gift of actually particles from the supernovae coming to Earth, right? Hakeem mentioned neutrinos before. And so the fact that it's not just the light that you see, but you actually can feel in some ways the supernovae makes it also that much more incredible. And yeah, also the amazing. supernovae have been so bright, right? historically they've been recorded that's what is like awesome you know right. chinese astronomers indian astronomers like you know almost a thousand years ago right were able to document the presence of uh, supernovae hey i have a feeling a lot of people are very curious about black holes because these questions keep coming in and this could this is a total <laughs> speculation but what kind of matter do you think is inside of a black hole so hakeem even though we can't hear you screaming from inside the black hole, what type of matter are you going to be seeing? So the the physics nerds are all going to laugh when I say this. Fermionic. <laughs> There's a physics nerd laughing right now. <laughs> what other kind of matter is there? Wait. <laughs> well, here's a, here's the cool thing though. Here's one question. So I, you know, all of us who do astronomy and physics, people write to us all the time with questions. Okay, and one of them. It's often about what happens inside of a black hole. Does stuff go into another dimension? What is its new form? Well, here's the thing we know. They grow. That means the mass is still there. It didn't disappear into another dimension. So yeah, it's all still there, right? But what do we call mass? So here's one of the things I wrote on my board back here. It's not my board. I'm in someone else's office, right? M equals E over C square. And I wrote it that way because, you know, there's been a move lately. Let's go and read the original papers. Let's look at how these people who originated these thoughts thought about these things. And when Albert Einstein came up with E equals MC square, he didn't come up with E equals MC square. He came up with M equals E over C square because he asked the question, if I have a chunk of iron and I heat it, I'm adding something to it, does it become heavier? Or it's hot and it's glowing make it lose weight? And the answer is yes. And Einstein concluded that mass is an illusion, right? What really exists is energy. And particle physics has sort of, has sort of verified this. Take the masses of the three quarks that make up the proton and neutron. If you add up those masses and compare it to the mass of the neutron and proton, you'll see that they only make up 1% of the mass of those particles. What's the other 99%? It's energy, right? And the energy and the bonds and the gluons and the virtual particles that exist. So I don't know what question you asked me that got me saying all that because I'm hella absent. I love it. I love it. But the point is, is that what we call mass and matter is based on our human experience. And that leads you wrong when, you tr when you're trying to understand the mental nature of the universe. This universe, I mean, I hate to put it this way, but it wasn't made for us. It was made for us in the beginning, but it's been trying to get rid of us ever since. Because if you look at the evolution of the universe, the universe has been going neutral under the influence of the four fundamental forces. Our understanding of how stuff came into existence, it came into existence equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And what happened? 
all of that fermionic stuff annihilated and all of that energy in the fermionic fields went into the electromagnetic field where the expansion of space stretches it and sucks it out and all the fermionic matter that's left right it gets all the light taken out of it right we look up at the sky it's getting the light squeezed out of it by gravity and then where is it all going to go into a black hole right the light gets stretched out the fermionic matter goes into the black hole and then we have a universe devoid of fermions but we came into existence and what is matter what is but concentrated energy right okay. we burn fossil fuels we create biomass what do I do when I need to, to get more energy? I eat one of my, my panelists, right? We, we are, you know, uh, what is it called? Um, yeah. what's that right. Hey, listen, if we find ourselves on a desert island or Mars, I'm eating everybody. But anyway, the, <laughs> <laughs> the point is... Something else I'm desert island. vegetarian. I was going to say I'm vegetarian. I should remain vegetarian. I eat... Oh, I'm, I'm, you first, I'm going to yeah. eat you first. If, that, if you're a vegetarian, that means you're... You're probably the most delicious person on the panel. So, and well, anyway, listen, I grew up in Mississippi in the woods eating everything that walked, right? So, not the yeah, well, You know, I wanted to add a little twist, which is even more mind boggling uh, mm -hmm. to what Hakeem um, uh, just recounted, which is like our universe originally, we believe, started out with matter and antimatter being in balance. And then somehow there was an imbalance and it has an excess of matter over antimatter. And we've not figured this out. Like we don't know how and why this happened. And it's, you know, if you're really thinking about philosophical questions, right, we wouldn't really be here if that asymmetry had not happened, right? Yeah. And we thought we had an answer and then the LHC <laughs> achieved the energies where we were supposed to see the answer. And it's like, nope, no answer. Not yet, yep. Not yet. <laughs> well, obviously, lots of things we don't, have, we don't have answers to. And there are so many good questions, but we're, we're slightly coming up on the end of time. I'm going to throw out one quick one because I think I can get this question in fast. And then I'll just make my ending a lot shorter because I'm the least important person here. Any fun guesses on the origins or mechanisms of mysteries like fast radio bursts, odd radio circles, etc.? Anybody want to take this in, in just a couple minutes? I actually don't Aliens. know what odd radio circles are, but I think I'm sort of um, a fast radio bursts are these very fast bursts of uh, radio pulses that we're detecting. And we believe now that they really have to do with neutron stars, phenomena that have to do with uh, maybe collisions of neutron stars. Um, and there are sort of burps, if you will, that are produced, uh, but they're related, we believe, to neutron stars. Right on. There's a logical explanation for everything. So <laughs> let me let me close this. Maybe not, actually. And speaking of which, that kind of brings me to the, the final question I have for everyone. You can take this in any direction you want. I think one of the one thing that we can all agree with as people who work in the sciences is there's no shortage of questions. There's no shortage of curiosities, regardless of what your specialty is. So going around to all four of you, what is something about our universe and our cosmic origins that you are most curious about? What is one thing that you want to see answered in our lifetime? Grant, I'll start with you. Yeah, sure. I, I, I think science is ultimately about slowly becoming less wrong over time and not more right. So I think in many ways, I'm more curious about the major things that we have wrong. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll say that. Um, I just say we've learned more about the cosmos and our place within it in say the last fifty years than we have than we have in the prior thirty six thousand years of astronomical history, and so we have we are just at the doorstep of this infinitely vast discovery space, um, and I have no doubt that one of our fundamental tenets of the universe will be shown wrong tomorrow or in ten years or a century from from now, and and slowly becoming less wrong over time, I think is part of the human journey and how science works. Slowly becoming less wrong over time. I like it. Akeem, do you want to go next and tell me what you're most curious about? What's the question you want to see answered? Yeah, no one else seems to be thinking about this, it seems. But, you know, I feel like we know so much about our universe now, about the what, that is, I think it's time to start asking the why. 
um, you know, you see trends in our universe. And so, you know, I, I liken it to being so tiny that the human cell is the size of, of you relative to a galaxy being the size of us now. And suppose you were inside of some uh, living animal and you were attempting to figure out the nature of your universe. If you did it the way we study the universe, what you would do is you'd look around you and you say, oh, I realize these cells are this far away. They work like this. They're these types. They distribute it this way. That's what we've done with the universe. So if you were in that position, could you create, if you were, say, inside of a human, an approximate human, could you figure out that you were inside of an approximate human? You wouldn't be able to figure out that that human is a <laughs> Right. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm thinking about. Is that the approximate human you just knocked over next to you? <laughs> no, that was somebody else. But, you know, I want to know the, the universe. What is it? You know, because it, it seems like, you know, the way we've studied it so far, it's not made for us. And we're in this tiny thing in this humongous vastness. And, you know, it's so complex and so layered. There has to be something else going on. Agreed. Agreed. Rhea, on to you. Yeah, so I think I'm, uh, you know, much more, um, I want to say modest, um, but it's going to sound very ironic when I tell you what it is that, okay, within my lifetime, I would really want two questions, two burning questions answered. One is, what is dark matter? What is it made of? What's the particle? Or is it unmatched socks? Like, I want to know what it is, okay? <laughs> and the other thing that I would like to really witness, right, is the collision of two supermassive black holes. I mean, they're happening, but I would like us to witness it. So measure the tremors, the earthquakes in space-time that that collision would create. Actually measure that, right? Detect that. I would like these two things to happen before, um, like, I am no more. Do, we, do you have any sense or guesses when two black holes will collide? What do you mean? They're colliding all the time. It's just that we don't have the equipment to, to hear it. So we are waiting. That's what I meant to ask. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, the um, European Space Agency, uh, in collaboration with NASA, are putting up this, uh, you know, formation of satellites called LISA that should go up in the 2030s. So, you know, those collisions are happening. Those uh, tremors in uh, space time are happening. We just don't have the equipment to detect them yet. So I think um, 2030s. 2030s. Yeah, and someone asked, did ask a question about Lisa. So I'm glad that you brought that up. And last but not least, Anjali, I'm, I'm so curious to hear what your answer is about <laughs> the questions you want to see answered, you extraordinary connoisseur of exoplanets. <laughs> I mean, but there's so many questions, not just about exoplanets. I mean, Priya touched on one of the questions that keeps me up at night, right? You know, what else is out there? And I think that is a question that applies both to the dark matter and the exoplanets. Um, I mean, you know, dark matter is particularly telling because what we're talking about, all the light we see from the stars, from the supernovae, from these galaxies and planets, um, that's just a tiny fraction of the matter that's out there in the universe. And so knowing that most of the universe is actually something that you can't see, right? Dark matter and dark energy. It's kind of humbling to think there's a lot more to understand. Um, and similarly with exoplanets, you know, of course we want to answer questions like, are we alone? And I'm pretty confident that within our lifetime, we will get answers to the questions of, is there life out there? What does it look like? I think we'll find it. Um, but I actually want to know about the diversity of other planets, other worlds, um, that are out there because, you know, right now we are looking for worlds like Earth, but there's probably a lot more out there that looks nothing like that. And so kind of like Grant and Hakeem alluded to of, you know, the surprises. Um, I really want to know these questions, um, you know, the answers to these questions of what else is out there, whether it's life, dark matter or something else. So I'm going to leave the question general enough so that I can feel satisfied in getting an answer within my lifetime. Well, I'm, I'm slow clapping to all of you. We're slightly over time, but I don't care. I'm hosting this. I'll do whatever I want. Um, you all are phenomenal and brilliant. And thank you so much for taking the time to share your insight with all of us and having such a natural conversation. The questions I want to see answered is when are astrophysicists going to impart enough knowledge to calm humans down and make us a little bit more grounded and humble and start treating our planet better? Because mm -hmm. that, is, that is essentially what I... But so many people grasp when they start to learn about the intricacies of the universe and they start to learn just how minuscule we are and how it's just, we're privileged to be 
here with at, at a blip in the mo in this moment of time that is co constantly passing even if we're looking at someone next to us what up right. anyway <laughs> uh, uh, I, just Anouk, I just wanted to say that's a wonderful note for you to um close it right because you really said the the perfect thing which is we are really insignificant in the grand scheme of things yet we are super significant when it comes to stewardship of our planet right and that we can do what it takes to combat that's climate change is. stop drinking plastic bottles just get a glass one folks anyway on that on that note um Priya, thank you. And thank you to everyone who tuned in for us. I, I love this audience because all of you are stewards in one way or another when it comes to science. So continue to spread the gospel about Nova and continue to ask questions. So many questions came up right now about the universe and our place in the cosmos. And hopefully throughout the series, you will learn more. So huge thank you to our panelists, Grant, Anjali, Priya, and Hakeem. You can find them all on social media and look at their content, ask them more questions. And we just want to thank them for sharing their time and knowledge with us. And thank you to our audience for your engagement, your curiosity, and your excellent, brilliant, esoteric, poetic questions I had to read two or three times. You can watch the next episode of Nova Universe Reveal tomorrow night at 9, 8 central on your local PBS station. Or if you can't wait, all episodes are currently available to stream on the Nova website, pbs.org slash Nova, or on the PBS video app. You can binge them as part of a very fascinating Saturday night date or make it the perfect Thanksgiving week binge opportunity. You can bond with your aunt while she's making mashed potatoes and your uncle while they're arguing over which stuffing is better. Just binge all the Nova universe and get some good dinner time conversation going on. And for even more universe content, you can listen to Nova Now Universe Revealed, a special five part podcast series hosted by a very loud pediatrician who you're looking at right now. And we'll explore fusion, the Milky Way, alien worlds, and more. You can subscribe for free to get all the episodes on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And for more resources, videos, and future events, follow us all on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or visit our website, pbs.org slash Nova. Thank you all again. Have an amazing evening. And tonight, I hope you have a little bit more of an appreciation and a little bit more insight when you look up at the stars. Sorry to end this on such a corny note.